I have the privilege of, of, of playing opera here and asking <laughs> Stephen all questions I would like to ask. And I think we should react to some of the things that we have just heard. When I was reading your bio in Medium, you say that you run fast and you break things. <laughs> so I think that's a very nice way of saying, with your venture experience, what have you learned that what needed to be broken? And was it fast or was it slow? Well, the, what needs to be broken is a lot of the societal institutions, insofar as we have a massive shift coming in the world, a, a demographic shift. Um, in my home country, in the United States, the, the baby boomers, or the, or the generation born after World War II, was the largest uh, generation up until next year, where the millennials become the largest percentage of the population and, and then the Gen Z behind them. So most institutions, like education institutions, do not properly prepare the um, students for the workforce today. Right? You're not gonna learn about AI, you're not gonna learn about robotics, which are, which are what the students are gonna be competing with uh, when they graduate. And so, so big institutions really need to change, but it's going very, very slow. And government is another one which is, is very broken and is going very slow, and a and, and variety of other industries as well. Right. Um, going into that sort of uh, conversation about the ecosystem, tell us why did you choose to go to the Vatican <laughs> to create an accelerator that is linked to the Vatican. I mean, if there's a place that is broken, it's that <laughs> one. Uh, but what do you, how do you see that as a, as a potential catalyst to, to the impact space? Well, I, I like to tell people, so I, I spent three months at the Vatican uh, r running an accelerator. Uh, I, I joke, I say I'm the Pope's VC. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and this is an institution that is so, um, allergic to outside influence and so unwilling to change that they literally build walls around um, the country. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we get a lot of flack because of, um, I don't like to say his name out loud, but, you know, the president of my country wants <laughs> to build a wall, and there's a humongous debate in the United States about that wall. And I'm like, this country actually built a wall. The Vatican has built a wall. So, in essence, the Vatican has been doing these 2,000-year-old plus traditions. And why did I choose the Vatican as a place to go build an accelerator and really spirit the conversation around impact? So, Twofold. The first is that the Vatican is one of the greatest places around impact. Even though a lot of the traditions are very old, the Vatican has a, a massive global distribution. If you, took, if you look at it from startup terms, it has a great global brand, a, that didn't come out right, a great global brand and great uh, distribution around the world. So meaning is if you want to get solar lights to people in Africa, you can actually uh, use the distribution engine of the Vatican itself. So uh, I thought it was a really good partner to, um, to work with a lot of these startups. And just by simple partnering with the Vatican um, engages in deeper conversation because the, the Vatican is such a famous and such an influential institution, the fact that they're looking at impact investing makes the conversation a lot easier to have. So we used it as a catalyst. That they, we felt that they were one of the best partners uh, to do it with. But the great thing is we brought startups into the Vatican, and when we left the Vatican, they were on Slack, meaning the Vatican went on Slack. So we, we definitely had some influence over the Vatican um, in that respect. Right, right. So maybe let's move a little bit into the VC model, because I think, you know, impact investing was coined about 10 years ago, and the latest uh, uh, Global Impact Investing Network report talks about 240 billion in assets, which while it is something to celebrate, is rather small. Is it, you know, is the VC and, you know, PE model the right model to apply to impact? Or should, be, should we be thinking differently in order to catalyze more capital? Yeah, so as, as we saw in the previous two sessions, um, it's a very, very small number. And when we went into the Vatican, we took the approach that VC was the way to go. That we said, you know, quite frankly, we had a little bit of maybe Silicon Valley arrogance where we said, oh, impact investors don't know what they're doing. Us VCs, we know what we're doing. We'll take the VC model and apply it to impact. Well, we learned that that works okay. That's one area to work on, but it actually is a bit in a, in a silo. And we were actually doing the things that we accuse the impact investors, or more importantly, the grant givers and the foundations and the government institutions of doing, which was acting in these silos. And then there's these other players, like banks. Banks have so much capital uh, to deploy. I mean, that's what they do. 
And we started coming up after our experience at the Vatican with the concept of blended capital. And blended capital is pretty interesting because what it does is it combines, a com it's a combination of grant giving, which goes in first to a company, and it's a grant that is, a, um, as was mentioned just in, in one of the previous sessions, is these foundations will go in and take a risk on something because it is very, very new. It's very, very nascent. And then equity investors, venture capitalists, impact investors can come in second after the uh, grants have been given and the company has kind of gotten off the ground. And then lastly, you layer on top of that commercial banking rates. The banks would love to be able to lend to impact companies at commercial rates, but it has to be de-risked by the venture capitalists before it and then the impact and grant givers before that. So blended capital is the notion of bringing all three out of the silos, because all three are in silos today, getting them out of the silos and investing in a deal together. And what makes impact, I'm sorry, what makes blended capital um, so special is that once you apply the blended capital, it would not make sense for a VC to do a deal without the other two sides. Or would it make sense for the bank to do a deal without the other two sides? Or it wouldn't make sense for the, um, the grant giver or the NGO to do a deal without the other two sides. So not only does it s get sequenced properly and have a really great impact, as you mentioned at the beginning of the question, it then opens up so much of a larger pool of capital. Oh, great. So if we stay on the blended finance, because I think this is something that we are hearing a lot more. Actually, this week, Convergence, which is a Canadian-based organization, launched the state of blended finance. And their numbers roughly were 100 billion have been deployed in blended finance uh, with an average size of 56 million per deal, uh, mostly through funds and with a very strong focus in Africa interestingly, especially in East Africa on the energy side. I mean, that's also another, you know, sort of drop in the bucket. Um, how, could, how could we accelerate blended finance? Because my question would be, could blended finance be the angel and the VC of a lot of the impact space? Yeah, I, I, I saw that same, that same report, and it's actually disappointing. And it's not disappointing because of the size. It's disappointing because they're taking the approach to these development projects in Africa. And don't get me wrong, blended capital is great for those development projects. But what about a seed startup working right here in, in Station F? Mm -hmm. A seed startup that is solving one of, as, as the Good Lab Tech folks told us before, solving some of the world's problems with technology. Um, the blended capital approach, that grant could be the seed investor, then the equity investor comes in, and then of course layer when the company's mature, layers on the bank. So ultimately the blended capital has the opportunity to take the, the model a lot further and actually reach a lot of startups because a lot of the startups that we see even in Silicon Valley are now starting to approach some of the world's problems because I saw a study recently that if you're trying to tackle all the problems with the UN SDGs, it's like a trillion dollar market opportunity. And that's huge. And, and investors like, like big numbers. They like, this is the first time I hear someone talking about a, a trillion dollar market opportunity. When I hear about the next Facebook, the next Google, they're all talking about unicorns, billion dollar opportunities. But actually, um, in the space that we're talking about are trillion dollar opportunities. Right. So maybe if we stay on that opportunity, I mean, why do you think um, you know, public investors should play a role. You know, we have development financial institutions, which is institutions that governments have decided to create to help strengthen the private sector. Um, are they doing their job, or are they actually perhaps even crowding out potential investors because they might be going to deals that are rather commercially oriented and they're not really going to the risky part of the, of the value chain? Yeah, I, I tend to agree that they're, they're doing their job insofar as funding those big projects, but they are ignoring a section of the market that's not getting served, and that's creating a big kind of haves and have-nots when it comes to the, the startups and the, and the other entrepreneurs, yeah. because we're seeing that a lot of these smaller deals are getting skipped over because the problem, of course, from a big fund or from a government development fund or a big private equity or venture fund, if you have a billion dollars to invest in a, in a venture capitalist fund or a PE fund or a government fund, your average check size is going to be 10 or 50 or 100 million. If you're a seed company, you're looking for two or three million. 
so you're going to get crowded out. So, so that is what's happening. And, and it's starting to be addressed with some market forces insofar as the concept of a micro VC. But we actually need micro blended, right? We need micro, micro grants, we need micro VC, and we need micro banking. Um, Omedia Network um, launched a report a few years ago that they called it the pioneer gap. What they meant by this was that capital flowing into early stage, not even angel, early right. stage was really, really limited. Um, and this definitely is causing an issue. Well, what's your take on that, given you're in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. and you know, you're know you used to really creating that? And also, are also is the supply of opportunities from the enterprises way too small, way too fragmented? Should there be some consolidation in order to be able to make better use of the limited yeah. capital? I, I definitely have strong opinions on this. I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> and partly from my personal experience. So let me just give you a very brief um, kind of introduction to that is I, I've done five different uh, startups in my adult life and all five were venture backed. And the very first one, so I'm a little old, um, so my first one was 20 years ago, and we raised um, about $36 million um, for a big Series A. Or, but it took us, and, and this is the important point, and which, which comes back to your question, is it took us to get from the idea to the first paying customer, maybe it took us about 15 or 20 million of that 36 million to kind of build the company. Things were expensive. There was no AWS there was no um, Skype, like everything was expensive, right? We had to build an office. Um, we, weren't, we weren't able to outsource overseas or to other parts of the country. Um, my last startup, which was built just a few years ago before I started uh, Fresco Capital, probably got started with maybe two or $300,000 of kind of initial kind of startup, um, startup capital to get from idea to the first paying customer. We still need the 36 million, right? Like we still need money to scale, but that comes later in the cycle. So I think startups need less and less money to get off the ground. So accelerators famously give out 25, 30,000 US dollars for a company to get off the ground. And a lot of times a company can use that as that first catalyst to, to get going. The problem that we're seeing, of course, is that um, anytime you read whatever, you subscribe to your favorite newsletter that talks about deals, the average deal size has gotten larger, larger, and larger, as I was just saying in, as part of that last question. And if you're looking to get off the ground in this, um, you know, the money flowing into the startups is not really getting there because they're relying, they meaning the, the larger, the later stage investors are relying on earlier stage investors to do that. But the problem, of course, is early stage investors are getting bigger and bigger funds, which then means they're writing bigger and bigger checks. So there's, again, there's a, this gap that's coming and we're starting to see that gap get filled by very unlikely sources, again, to the blended capital model is um, we looked at a company recently that was um, a graduate from USC, and they built it during their senior year at the University of Southern California. And what was interesting about it was that the university was paying the students to do the startup, more or less. I mean, of course, they're paying, they have their tuition, they went to the school, but the university was the seed funder. And in essence, it was a grant because they weren't taking equity. And the startup even told me they had to go to a conference that was in Las Vegas. And the, sco the students went for free, meaning the university paid for them to go to that conference. And I joked with them because they're all 20 years old and the drinking age in Nevada is 21. So they weren't getting a free trip to go drinking in Las Vegas and gambling in Las Vegas from their school. So in essence, this is that blended capital approach because now as venture capitalists, we're looking at the company because it's been a little bit de-risked. But more importantly, they only needed $50,000, $100,000 to get off the ground and they got it through a combination of grants and in-kind investments. So, so in essence, it's, it's, it's desperately needed and it's starting to get filled by these other players in the ecosystem. Right. Perhaps if we can switch a little bit the conversation to, to the providers of capital. I mean, for the most part, people that are entering tend to be ultra high net worth individuals or family offices, foundations, and perhaps a few institutions. Could we democratize the capital uh, that is flowing into impact? What, what I mean is could crowdfunding or could some technological ways could also allow all of us here, regardless of whether, whether we're students or we, are, or we have deep pockets to invest. Because I do feel that this has become like an industry for the qualified investor. 
Oh, you're you're, you're talking um, you're, you're you're talking about a very big problem that that exists in 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 the in the world actually is that most of you read in the newspaper or you read online and you read about this company went public and their investors made three hundred percent you know or three three thousand percent a return or Peter Thiel put a hundred thousand dollars into Facebook and it turned into half a billion dollars. I can't even calculate the return on the IRR on that right like that's. 5,000x, not even percent, I can't even, right? So the problem was Peter Thiel was a billionaire that had $100,000 spared laying around where most people don't have access to that kind of capital or, or might have some capital, they might have $10,000 or $5,000 to invest in a company, but then are prevented because they're not what's, what the regulators call um, a qualified investor. So one of the very last things of the Obama administration passed was called the Jobs Act. And it actually, um, you know, you probably read a lot about the messed up politics in the United States. This one actually had a lot of bipartisan support. So supported by both the Democrats and the Republicans. It had to, because the, the Republicans at the time controlled the whole Congress. And the Jobs Act um, made crowdfunding legal for equity crowdfunding, which was the first step, but then it said you can also do it for unqualified investors. So really anyone can go put money in and they just have to be vetted insofar as that if their net worth is only $100,000, they can't put a $50,000 you know, check into a company. And there's now a bunch of platforms out there that allow you to participate in the crowdfunding. Some of them that existed already, which were like the Kickstarters, which is one, in Indiegogo is one that will let you do that. There's also one in New York City called Republic, which is allowing you to do that as well. And uh, we at Fresco are doing a joint venture with Republic and building a fund around the companies that are coming out of, um, of this crowd equity funding because we realize it tends to be the companies you're describing. They're either impact investments, which they went to go pitch traditional venture capitalists, and the traditional venture capitalists said, oh, no, no. Your, your, you know, your, your impact, go talk to impact investors. But they go talk to the impact investors and the impact investors say, well, you're for profit. Uh, we don't want to touch you. So then what do they do? They pivot and they make, they make Instagram, right? And that doesn't, that doesn't work, right? If you're an impact investor, you want to make them to stay impactful. So um, I know that there is a, um, a crowdfunding site here that takes equity in France, um, which I actually met with yesterday called Lita. Um, I think I'm saying it correctly. So um, I know that the rules here in France allow non-accredited investors to do it as well. So it's um, really great to see that happen. Yes, yes. Europe does have a little bit of that retail angle. Yeah, the, we can learn the, something about that, I think. In the US. <laughs> great, great. Uh, maybe to, before we pass it on to the panel, um, you know, capital is an important part of it, but there is also an ecosystem around that. And that ecosystem also links to impact jobs. I mean, you have been a mentor, you've been obviously uh, working with accelerators. Any sort of, you know, comments or recommendations for people who want to work in the impact space, who want to bring their skill sets from their other sectors and engaging in the impact investing space? Yeah, very much so. I think all of you out there in the audience, if you're contemplating some kind of career in impact or some kind of shift to impact, I think it's pretty wise. Um, I'll mention one thing first, and then I'll go back to the kind of the career advice is um, we as venture capitalists, you probably think we have the best job in the world, right? Oh, you guys have all this money and you get to meet all these great entrepreneurs and make decisions. Well, all you founders out there that raise, spend all the time raising money and hate it, you have to realize that us VCs have to go raise money too. It's not like that money was just handed to us. So we go out and raise money. They're called limited partners, our investors. And um, I spoke to so many limited partners over the last four or five years building Fresco Capital. And I can't tell you how many of them have said, we're now going to do only impact investing, meaning is our, our family office or our pension fund, our endowment fund is only going to focus on impact moving forward. And they're very serious about this. It's not like you can kind of like pretend your impact, like, you know, startups like that are, um, you know, a food delivery service then goes, oh, but we're, we're AI and blockchain. Now we're, now we're a unicorn, right? Like you can't do that as a VC fund. If you invest in like this, you know, company that's like this destroy the environment company and this destroy the ecosystem, you know, company, you, you invest in all these these negative impact companies, you can't hide that from a potential investor, right? So they're very serious about passing on a venture fund, um, which tells me if the venture, if the venture capitalist source of capital is moving towards impact, and as the younger generation, as I mentioned earlier in our conversation, right, we know that the younger generations are more interested in impact. Obviously, the future is going to be revolving around impact. So, so the opportunity is enormous. 
And as for like the career advice of getting into it is, it's not like you have to go out and get a degree in public policy or go out, go out and get a degree in some type of um, some discipline like that, or it's not like you need to have a tremendous amount of experience working at an NGO. Impact is starting to become part of the entire ecosystem. So that means pretty much any skill set that you have is relevant. And now, more importantly, it, it, I, you know, I, I grew up, you know, we're roughly the same age, you know, and we worked on Wall Street. We don't have, to say, we don't have to say, we're old. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I started on Wall Street in the early 90s, um, which was a mistake, and then I went into entrepreneurism. But when you were looking at CVs and resumes of people, and if it said that they worked 10 years at an NGO, like it literally just went right into the garbage, where today that's not the case. So if you want, it's actually seen as a plus. Right? Because the hiring managers today see that diversified um, portfolio of work experience that we were talking about before is, is quite critical. So um, jumping into an impact um, role, either at a company or at an NGO or something, is a great move in anyone's career. Right. Steven, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, please uh, allow me to applaud with all of you, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Steven's participation. Um, you will find him in the halls. You can discuss and take this conversation forward.